Okay, looks like everybody's done. Let's um, hand in and uh, let's get uh, started with a um, lecture. So we we had arrived at the point where in the process the the steel chemistry is set, the, um, the temperature is set, the melt is um, homogeneous in terms of temperature and composition. So you're basically coming out of the secondary, very important secondary metallurgy, and your ladle is now uh, ready to uh, deliver the, uh, the steel to the casting. Most of the casting nowadays is by continuous casting. So you, you uh, produce a continuous and endless um, uh, strip or uh, amount of material, yes, uh, continuously. The um, big advantages to uh, working this way is in terms of cleanliness of the steel and general um, properties in terms of segregation. Um, so you, compositional and microstructural homogeneity of the material is much better in case of continuous casting. You still do a lot of uh, ingot casting, but those are usually uh, in the area of, uh, used in the area of uh, forgings, to make forgings. So it's not a very large amount of the production, of steel production that goes into um, ingot casting. So we'll focus on continuous casting because 95 or, or more percent of the steels are actually made by continuous casting. So this is a, um, a schematic of, of what we call a slab caster. Mm, so you, you have a rectangular section, yes? Uh, and um, you can see where we start, start up there uh, in the ladle. The ladle um, has an opening at the bottom and it's poured into a tundish. Yeah? And the, 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 um, the role of the tundish is basically to distribute the, um, the liquid steel in the caster. And the caster itself is a water-cooled oscillating copper mold, and it's, it's a bottomless mold. It has no bottom. Yeah? And, and that's what you pour. Yeah? We'll, we'll see what happens, but the, the material partially solidifies, yes? Yes. And you can just pay, and it's basically being pulled out of the, uh, uh, the caster by the oscillating movement of uh, the caster. So when the caster goes down, the material moves down, yes? The skin of the, the, uh, uh, what you just poured is solidified. So when the, the caster goes up, yes, it's, uh, it's retained by these rolls, yes? yes? And, and so slowly the material uh, advances out of this, this mold, yeah? Um, we then have, in general, a bending zone. Yeah? So you cast vertically and you, you, your material comes out horizontally, so you're going to have to do some change of direction here. So that's done in the bending rolls, and you have support rolls and bending rolls in this, uh, in, in this section. And in between the rolls, you will need to cool the material. You'll need to cool it because uh, it's not solidified. It's partially solidified. Um, so the cooling is with water sprays between the rolls. Of course, you will lose heat to thermal radiation, roll contact, cooling, etc. 
And then uh, at the end, you um, do the cutting of the, um, uh, this endless uh, uh, strip of material with torch cutting. And then what you get out is then called a slab. Let's have a look at um, some, some different, um, different um, types of, of casters, yes? And nowadays, um, the, 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 the types that uh, we, you see most are we called curved casters, yes? But um, there are other uh, casters, which we, uh, the one is, uh, uh, you, you have uh, vertical casters, yes? Um, there you, you cast the material and you solidify it, yes, in the vertical direction. Mm? And, so, and then you have special um, construction here that, that will um, flip it horizontally. Mm? You can have casters with a very long straight segment, yes, and then a bending. And uh, these casters, the slab is bent in once it's solidified. Hmm? And you have uh, similar uh, casters with a shorter uh, vertical section. They will uh, have um, the, the bending, the solidification will happen during bending. So, and, and there are different sizes, they're more compact, yes. Um, but in the, in the um, curved uh, uh, casters, you always have solidification during um, bending. Hmm? So, why are people interested? What, why did you decide, how do you decide which one to get? Obviously, um, there is a matter of cost. Uh, vertical casters are, are expensive, obviously, because they're much taller, yes. Um, however, there are some advantages to uh, the use of the, uh, these casters because there's no bending and unbending. There's no bending and unbending of the material, right? So when you, when you bend the material here, it basically means that you bend it and then you have to unbend it, right? So there's deformation of the slab, yes. So there's, there's, you, you're not going to have these, this type of stresses. Yeah? And then um, the metallurgical center, what we call the metallurgical center, that's where uh, the, uh, the solidification ends, yes? is well defined, as in the center of the, of the, of the, um, the cast uh, material. Yeah? In the, uh, when you have a, um, a curved caster, uh, the metallurgical center and the geometrical center of your, uh, of your slab or your billet uh, or your bloom, uh, they don't match. Hmm? So it's off-center. Hmm? And you have, of course, bending stresses. Hmm? So in general, you will see that um, for higher-end products where stresses, etc., are important, yes, surface quality, uh, homogeneity, etc., uh, you will see these kind of uh, vertical casters. But in general, most of the time you see basically uh, a, um, a curved caster, yes, uh, that operates on uh, two floors, about 10 to 12 meters high. And this is, this is a typical view here. This is the, the view of the, the casting hall. Hmm? Um, so you see here on one floor, you have the casting floor, you have the, the, the ladle here, ladle here, ladle here. You, you notice they're mounted on a turret, so you can uh, continuously uh, uh, pour material. So when this ladle is empty, you put this ladle in position, yes? And of course there is liquid metal in the tun dish, yes? So you can continue pouring um, while you are replacing uh, the ladles, yes? And so, so the material, uh, you don't see here the, the curves, and, but you see here the slab coming out. Hmm? And if we look a little bit closer, this is the ladle. This is a tundish, yes? 
which is basically like a reservoir for the, uh, the metal and a distributor of the uh, liquid metal. And here, this plate here, plate-like thing, is the, is the oscillating mold. Hmm? All right, let's have a look at more detail at, uh, first of all, the, this tundish, yes, tundish. The, um, so, so the tundish is, is where you, the, the liquid metal goes into first. It doesn't go right into the oscillating mold, right? So it's an intermediate container, and it's also a container that distributes the liquid. Hmm? So why do we need this intermediate container? Because we like to cast continuously, so when, you, when, when the, the ladle is empty, yes, um, you need to remove it, change to another ladle, so there needs to be intermediate um, uh, uh, reservoir of liquid steel. Hmm? Um, so, so it has a special construction inside because you want to avoid turbulence, yes? You want to have a very stable uh, flow of metal, so you avoid turbulence. Um, you can still uh, use the opportunity to uh, remove non-metallic inclusions because you need to protect the surface of the metal. It has a large surface of metal that's exposed to, to air, right? You need to protect that. So there will be some slag uh, used here. Okay, and then, the, um, and then you pour through these uh, nozzles, nozzle openings here. Now, uh, usually the, the schematic here shows four different types, yes? So usually there's one type, yes? So, but here the schematic show one type, what's called a metering nozzle, which is basically a hole, yes, in the bottom of the turn dish. Then you have uh, uh, what's uh, more uh, common are uh, 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 no, um, nozzles which, or, yes, which have, give you the opportunity to open and close the, uh, the um, flow of the steel. Hmm? So here you have a sliding gate or you have stoppers. You know, stoppers which uh, will prevent the, the, liquid, the metal from uh, flowing. So, yeah. uh, then um, what is also important, the metal flows in these three last systems in uh, a tube which we call um, uh, submerged uh, entry nozzles, yes, submerged entry nozzles. The, the uh, word submerged uh, refers to the fact that this tube is into the liquid metal in the mold. It's under the surface. Um, now, you have metal flowing through uh, this system. You want to avoid um, oxidation. You want to avoid pickup of uh, nitrogen, yes? Um, you want to avoid resulfurization, yes? So we have, we use shrouds. Shroud is basically you flow argon gas around all the critical openings, yes, in the system. For instance, here where the ladle is connecting to the uh, tundish, where the Tundish is connected to the casting. Yeah? So you have um, this very important uh, flow, basically flow of uh, argon that will prevent um, pickup of um, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, etc. Hmm? Okay, that's the most important thing. So now the next thing is to look into the casting, the caster itself. The caster um, is basically an open mold, so a bottomless mold. So this is here the, uh, the edge of this mold. It's copper, yes, and it's, it's uh, cooled. It's water cooled, right? so there's, it's, there's water flowing through it. And this here, this tube here, is the entry nozzle. It's submerged entry nozzle, and the metal flows through it. Uh, through and, and comes out uh, on, through sides, holes made on the sides of this tube. Yeah? 
So it flows to the left here, to the left. Okay. Again, this uh, the metal, yes, needs to be protected against reoxidation, yes, and we have what's called flux on it or casting powder, yes. So this uh, is a, a very special type of uh, powder, yes, that will protect the material, the, the steel, from uh, oxidizing, from picking up hydrogen or nitrogen, and it will also act as a lubricant, yes, so that um, it, can, um, it, can, it can slide against the, the mold. Hmm? You have to imagine that when the steel uh, touches the mold, it solidifies, yes? Hmm? So it shrinks, right? And uh, you slide it along the wall, and there is a liquid flux, yeah, which is uh, formed uh, at the surface of the steel. So, and you form a, a skin, yes? Skin on the, on the, sl on the slab, on the, at the surface of the metal, yes? Which solidifies gradually. But by the time you, you leave the mold, yes, this, uh, the steel is by no means um, fully solidified. There's still a lot of liquid zinc inside, yes? Uh, liquid steel inside, excuse me. And, and so uh, in between the support rolls, yes, and the bending rolls, the, the, what, the, the ferrostatic pressure will deform the surface of the uh, material, right? So you'll have some bulging, yeah? Okay, so in between, that's why in between you, you, there's a lot of cooling to accelerate the, the cooling here, okay? Okay, so um, interesting. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 this casting powder, yes, mm -hmm. uh, in, in order to, to make these uh, fluxes, is, is very rich in sodium oxides and, and uh, fluorine compounds, yes? Um, and so very often um, you, um, uh, or very often you may have, you may encounter in practice um, problems, uh, surface problems in a product. And one of the ways in which you can uh, recognize that an inclusion or a surface defect is related to the casting, yes, is by identification of the composition of the uh, of these inclusions, yes. And uh, so uh, th this is the only place in the process, yes, where, where you use this type of um, this type of slag compositions, yes. So high sodium and high fluorine contents. Yeah? So if you ever come across surface problems and you find high amounts of sodium, don't think it's sodium chloride, yes, uh, or a corrosion problem. It may be a, uh, a casting crack, casting-related cracks. And of course, um, We'll, as we'll see, uh, the risk of um, making surface defects is very high. You can imagine this is steel uh, at, uh, so the, the inside is 1500, so it has to be uh, higher than the, 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 the melting temperature, right? So we're talking, depending on the grades, et cetera, 1500 to 1600 degrees, yes? in terms of uh, casting, yeah. um, the strength of this uh, high temperature uh, film is very low, yes? So we're, we're talking about less than 50 megapascal of strength here, okay? So it's the risk that you're going to uh, produce surface defects is very high. Uh, very often when you visit steel plant, uh, you, you know, it all looks like very powerful, big machines, etc. Uh, uh, but the, the steel itself um, and uh, the heavy machinery 
uh, that's all because it's very heavy, yes? But the steel itself, in terms of strength, yeah, is actually very soft. You can easily damage the surface, right? And so it's very important to uh, never to forget that because very often surface defects that you create um, during hot deformation and casting will remain in the material till the very end, yes? Um, this is an example here um, where you're looking at a, um, a, a strand caster. So instead of having one, um, uh, one single slab, you get strands of uh, blooms or billets coming out of the caster. So for instance here, um, you see the uh, ladle, yes? The, here is the tundish, and this is the, uh, uh, the casters. Yeah? So now we have one, two, three, four uh, uh, separate casters. Hmm? So uh, this is the, the top of the uh, uh, mold. Yeah? So you see the mold entry. Now the caster is basically this billet. Yes? Okay, it's not a big slab, it's a billet and you cast this, this one entry nozzle for each billet. Yeah? And, and if you look down this caster, yes, it, uh, the caster actually looks more comp much more complex than just a piece of cup water-cooled copper. Yes? So th th this, uh, this here is what you see if you look on the side. What you have is this, this construction here that will be moving up and down. Yes, it's the entry mold. Then we have here a attachment which is called an EMS system. That's electromagnetic stirrer. Electromagnetic stirrer. Talk about this in a moment. And then um, uh, already attached to the uh, the mold yes section is you have the exit cooling of the strand. So the strand comes out, goes through an electromagnetic stirrer, and then right into the, uh, the strand cooling. Hmm? Okay. Yeah. So, um, very important uh, here to remember is, uh, so critical things are the, uh, you, you want to have a shroud here, yes? Um, the clogging I was uh, uh, mentioning on Monday, this is where it occurs, right? This is, this is where it occurs in the the submerged entry nozzle, yes? And you can see here that, of course, if you have large deposits of, uh, of, of solid on this tube inner, the flow, the amount of, of, of steel that comes out will be influenced, right? And so um, you'll, you'll have an unstable casting, no? okay? Um, the, um, right, then, um, Okay, so first of all, about the, the, the clogging here, uh, remember what I said on Monday, we, we add calcium to uh, modify our alumina inclusions. You form calcium aluminates, yes, and these are liquid, yes, and so um, if they're liquid, they, don't, they won't, you know, stick to this wall and they'll just flow out. Um, if you've added too much calcium, Yes, you can have problems with calcium sulfide, yes? And then th that can also give you clogging or abrasion, and then the abrasion is again in this tube, yeah? Okay, when the liquid moves out, yes, this, it goes it, with um, uh, high velocity sideways, yes? Like, like shown here, okay? okay? Right, now, we don't like to do this. Yes, we don't like to have this kind of strong flows whenever you cast, yeah? And, um, and that's one of the reasons why we add these electromagnetic stirrers, the EMS systems, yeah? To control, yes, what is left of liquid inside the material, hmm? okay? And we, we will add these electromagnetic stirrers at different positions. First of all, um, let's, 
have a look at what the functions are of these uh, electromagnetic stirrers, yes. Segregation, you can influence segregation. You can improve inclusion removal. You can decrease temperature loss or inhomogeneity. And uh, minimize a very pronounced solidification microstructure. So um, the, these EMSs are put, can be put at different places in during the casting. When we put them up high, yes, yes, in the caster, yes, like when we put an EMS, for instance, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, okay, like in this case, the effect of the uh, EMS is, is to work as a break, yeah, like a break. What you do, let me get a pen here, so sure, yeah. uh, by having an, uh, uh, basically you have inducting an inductor here, right? You just have, it's, it's basically an inductor, yes, uh, a coil that you pull, yeah. The, uh, it will provide a force, electromagnetic force, that work goes in, to, in this direction. So that breaks the flow of the, uh, the outgoing flow of the, um, the, the, the metal, yes? Okay? So you basically uh, avoid very high uh, velocities here. Hmm? You can... Um, also, uh, put an EMS v later, yes? There it will mix the metal. It will keep the metal moving so that you don't have compositional gradients. Yeah? Let's have a look at that. Hmm? Okay. So, why, I, why is this important to minimize uh, compositional gradings, gradients or to minimize microstructural um, uh, uh, microstructural feature. Well, if we have, you, you, you probably know this from, from undergraduate studies, is when, when the metal will solidify, like steel solidifies, um, the, you, you form, hmm, when the cooling rates are uh, not too high, you form large crystals. Yes, large crystals which we call dendrites. Yes, dendrites. Yes, and during the solidification of these dendrites, we get partitioning. So certain elements will enrich in the solid, other elements will partition to the liquid. Yes, so we get two things. Yeah? Um, we get dendritic microstructures and we get compositional differences. Yes, the center here doesn't have the same composition as the on the side. So, but by mixing the liquid, yeah, while it solidifies, we can minimize this. Hmm? Um, right, I, I, uh, this is actually uh, a continuously cast uh, microstructure. Uh, it's an example of a Fort uh, 39 um, uh, stainless steel, yes? So, um, the microstructure that it doesn't go through transformations like um, uh, regular carbon steels or austenitic stainless steel. So the microstructure you get in the slab is actually the, the high temperature structure. So you can see that uh, close to the wall of the, uh, of the uh, uh, copper mold, you get very quick uh, solidification, yes? And so you get small grains, that's good, but inside the cooling rates drop dramatically and, and you get these uh, dendritic microstructures. So that's why we will um, add these um, uh, stirrers. Yeah? So this is an example here. It's a billet, yes, a square billet, mm -hmm. not a slab, a square billet. And this one is cast without uh, an EMS, and you can see the, this patterning here, which are dendrites, yes? They're large dendrites. If you 
uh, have an EMS in the line, you can minimize the growth of these dendrites, and you can also see that the center line segregation is much lower. So you get your, your, your billet is more homogeneous, okay? Okay. Now, a lot of this equipment uh, and attachment to a line depends on uh, your investments, possibilities that you have, and on uh, how, how worried you are about quality issues. Yes? So, there, so you have um, casters which have uh, EMS everywhere, yes, and you have casters who have None, yes? So it's, it's, not, it's not always there as a rule. Hmm? Depends pr pretty much from company to company. Hmm? All right, so again, when you look at the casting, yes, it looks like there's nothing much to it to worry about it. It works um, very smoothly, nothing happening, right? Uh, but there are many issues that are of importance to steel products, yes? And uh, in particular related to uh, defects, um, which, which we generally call cracks, yes? And it's, it cracks is a very, you know, surface cracks in casting, it's a big bag of many things, yes? Um, so one of them, which is important for steel products, is the, uh, the peritactic steels, yeah? A peritactic steel is defined as, as, a, as a steel which, where you, when you uh, solidify it, it goes to the peritactic reaction. Yeah? So this is the only time that I focus on uh, another part of the uh, iron carbon diagram in this course, and that's at high temperatures. So at high temperatures in your iron carbon diagram, you have the peritactic reaction yes, here. Okay, and if you have steel compositions, yes, um, less than 0.2% of carbon, and those are many steel compositions, yes, uh, you will go through um, two contraction steps. There are two con during solidification contraction steps. There's a first contraction, the reactions are shown here, yes, when the liquid, so you, you look here, yeah, oops, in this, in this zone here. Yeah. So first, when you solidify, the liquid goes to liquid plus delta, yes? So there is a solidification here, um, a contraction, yeah? During solidification. And then there is a second contraction when you go through the peritactic reaction here, at the peritactic, yeah? And that is the liquid becomes gamma, a mixture plus of gamma plus delta. Hmm? And you can uh, measure the uh, thermal contraction, yes? Hmm? If you do the, uh, the casting in this zone here, yes? Depending on what temperature you look, right? You do the, uh, the solidification here. So you see this big contraction, yes? And if you do the solidification at lower temperature, it becomes even bigger, yeah? Okay. So that, what does that mean? You have a surface, yes? It contracts. The center doesn't contract, right? So you've got stresses. This is material at, between 1400 and 1500 degrees C, I just told you the strength of this material is very, very low. So cracks can develop at the surface, yes? Small cracks. So um, the, when uh, people measure the occurrence of surface cracks, you know, they observe, always observe a very large maximum of surface cracks at 0.1 to 0.2% of carbon. Yeah? And what people also measure is, for instance, the depth of, the, of what we call oscillation marks. Hmm? You remember that 
uh, I said the uh, uh, casting unit moves up and down with a certain frequency hmm? and uh, so it moves up and down about about a, you know some of the order of a centimeter yes up and down with certain frequency yeah and uh, every time it goes up and down yes you will have stresses yeah because when it moves up Move, moving down, it's together with the slab. Moving up, you stress the, the slab, right? Um, and this motion, yes, uh, oscillating motion, leaves also surface marks, which we call oscillation marks, yes? And um, casters and uh, steel makers in general don't like big oscillation marks, yes? But you can see that the depth of the oscillation marks yes, are very large in the case of uh, peritactic steels. Okay. Okay, so peritactic steels, very careful. Um, that's, so, so steels are sensitive to surface cracks uh, because of their composition yeah, and the way they solidify. Um, you can get other cracks in developing in the material. You remember that when you cast a slab, yes, you also, in, in many of these equipments, you bend it, yes? So you, you actually put deformation on the material, okay? So what happens? Well, you can get cracks developed. This is an example here where it's really bad. I mean, a good example of a bad slab with some big cracks, yes, in a slab. Mm -hmm. the, you're cooling the material, right? And um, we know that, um, you know, in our composition, we, for instance, added uh, niobium or vanadium because we want to do some precipitation hardening, yes? And so what these compounds do, they precipitate while we're cooling the slab and casting it, yes? And because we're cooling very slowly, yeah, they tend to form precipitates at grain boundaries, yes? And they weaken the grain boundary strength at these very high temperatures, right? It's not a problem at room temperature because you control the distribution of these precipitates. But at high temperature, they form where they want and they're very coarse, yes? So we observe a ductility gap, yes? So if you measure the elongation of a material in conditions of continuous casting, very important. So very slow strains, Yes, at very high temperatures, yes. And you measure the reduction of section, so the, the, uh, the, re, the, the, the plastic deformation of the, uh, where you get the fracture, yes. So if something is very plastic, the reduction before fracture is very large, yes, 100%, yeah. So at high temperature, that's what you measure. A like thousand degrees, you measure very high uh, ductility. But if you go to, in the range of 800 to 900 degrees, you, it just drops to 30%. So your material is like unbrittled, yes, due to these precipitates here. And then at lower temperature, the ductility comes back. Um, but these kind of temperatures, you the slab is exposed to. Yeah? For instance, at at the surface. Yes. And so this can also give cracks. And if in, in really bad cases, yes, uh, the cracking can, be, uh, can even be inside the slab. Hmm? Yeah, so hot cracking. Okay. okay. So this is what comes out here. Again, uh, the slab looks nice and straight. Don't forget it's been bent once and twice, bending, unbending. Um, and um, and there, it may have uh, cracks at the surface. Hmm? Um, 
usually for slabs, you're looking at 25 centimeters of thickness. Their length is about uh, 10 meters, can be longer, 12 meters, but that's typical length. And the width depends on, uh, for, for slab here, at the width of the caster, yes? And the width doesn't change very much, yes? So the caster, um, um, actually also the, the dimension of the caster also defines the, width, the maximum width of, for instance, uh, uh, sheet products that you manufacture. Hmm? So if you have caster that, that can only do uh, 1.2 meters, you will not be able to provide material to customers that need 1.6 meters. Yeah? For instance, automotive constructor, construction needs you know, 1.6, very common, right? So you, 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 the caster will be, uh, should be uh, able to uh, provide this material. Hmm? So, um, right, and the, once the slab is made, it, it, it cools, it's marked, you remove burrs, and, and uh, then you stack the material. Because this process is an endless process, yes, you basically have to produce the same thing all the time, right? So how do you make different compositions, right? So you want to have a... Uh, um, a low carbon steel, and other time you want to have an eight, a micro alloyed steel, right? So, how do you do this? Well, you have to make transition slabs. Yes, you have to basically, you know, uh, if you want to make a change in steel chemistry, you will have to waste material. You'll have to cast slabs that go from the previous chemistry to the next chemistry. Yes, and so. So you can, you know, depending on how good you are, yes, and, and, and of course what product it is, you know, you, you can have to scrap a few slabs or a few meters of materials, yeah? Uh, uh, a few meters, that may mean uh, quite a few tons of steel, okay? Yeah. Uh, so it's expensive, okay? So when, as a young researcher, you go to a steel plant, you know, you cannot ask them to make something for you, right? Because it doesn't work that way, okay? They cannot make something for you in a steel plant just like this. You know? Somebody, uh, this needs to be organized, uh, you know, because normal production is all programmed. You know? Good. And that's also always why it's so challenging to introduce new products in, in big companies like this because, you know, uh, these, uh, the plants are designed for uh, continuous production. So there is no, not much space, there's no space to do experiments, yes, or very little. Uh, and so introduction of new products means a big organizational uh, uh, task group has to be organized to, to do this, yes. Right, so, so typical uh, things here, exit temperatures, slab thicknesses, again, as I said, typically 25 centimeters, lengths 10 to 12 meters. And, um, okay, so, so the, and, um, the, the width of the slab is, you know, has big impact because obviously, um, here, this is one meter, your, the equipment that comes next, the hot, hot strip mill, you know, has to be able to roll this material, right? So it, um, everything, the, the hot strip mill dimensioning has to be in, um, in, um, in agreement with the widths that uh, is provided, huh? and the final width requirements, okay? It's one thing, uh, just, just for your information, uh, uh, that is uh, sometimes used. Hmm? That's, that's called the uh, PIW. It's uh, uh, used in North America. It means pounds per inch of width of your, um, of your slabs or your coils. Yes? And um, 
the, the, the reason why it's used is because it gives you an idea of, uh, you know, the, your, your male size, your caster size, yes? And uh, what it basically is, is a very simple concept. Is, is you know, when, when you have, take for instance, you have a slab here, yes? And the slab is turned into a, uh, a, uh, a, a strip here that's rolled and then into a cold rolled strip, yes? That's coiled, yes? Um, the amount of material, yes, in terms of weight that you, uh, so if you cut off here one millimeter of material from this slab, yes, or one millimeter from this uh, intermediate uh, uh, product, or one millimeter from this uh, coil, it's all, it all has the same weight, yes? So that gives you, uh, it basically gives you an idea of the kind of productivity your male can achieve. Hmm? So uh, it's, it's basically specific coil weight. Yeah? It's the weight, yeah? the weight per inch of width or um, per uh, millimeter of width. So, so what is it? This, how do you calculate it? It's the length times the thickness times 12 times the density. Hmm? And you can, uh, if you want, uh, to use um, a metric PIW, it's, it's, uh, so that's basically uh, kilograms per millimeters yes, of uh, width. It's the American, the PIW divided by 50. So what typically uh, modern um, production units are around 20 <coughs> kilos per millimeter. So that's if you take a strip of coil, you cut it off, it gives you uh, about 21, uh, excuse me, 20 kilos per millimeter. So this is an example here, yeah? For instance, a thousand pounds per inch width PIW coil, yes? You can recalculate this, that this is 21 and a half kilos uh, specific weight. Okay, so it gives you an idea of coil sizes, uh, slab sizes that are routinely uses, used in the, uh, in, in, in the, the steel production unit you're, t what you're visiting, for instance. Okay, now, um, it's, it's always interesting to, to spend some time um, talking about nomenclature, yes? So a caster uh, will produce slabs and blooms and billets and so what are these and, and um, what's the difference? Well, um, in, and, and also what's important um, uh, to realize, these products, slab, blooms, and um, billets, are also products that a steel plant will sell to customers, yes? So we call these um, uh, uh, products, uh, given the following names. So, in what the steel company produces are what we call semis, semi-finished products and finished products. So, for instance, what is a semi-finished product? Yes, the semi-finished products are slab, blooms, and billets. Yeah. So, semi-finished means like half-finished. Yes, it still needs processing. It's not a finished product. What is a finished product? are the things we, we discussed previously. For instance, sections, like bars, wire, rails, or flat products, plates, hot roll strip, cold roll strip, yeah? Right, so slab blooms and billets, so what comes out of a continuous cast uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a steel plant, basically, in are semi-finished products, hmm? and they will be processed Further, in other companies, yes, yes, they can be processed inside the company that produced these uh, cast products, or they can be sold to outside products. Hmm? Yeah. So you can already see the uh, uh, these two products where there's always a lot of confusion about what's the difference. Yes. Well, so so. A, 
a bloom kind of looks like this and a billet looks like this, right? Uh, well, wh where do we make the difference? Right? Where, would, where, where does our definition between uh, bloom and billet uh, change? Well, in other words, what's the difference between a billet and a bloom? Well, anything that's larger than seven by seven, yes, is called a bloom, yes? And uh, when it's smaller than this, Seven by seven inch, yeah, that's uh, about uh, 17 and a half millimeter, we call a billet. Yeah? That would be simple, yes, uh, it's a simple definition, but uh, billets and blooms come in different sizes, yes. Uh, they're not always square, they're not always square, um, they can be round, they can be rectangular, yes, depending on. Uh, the application. So, what we um, usually, uh, alternatively, uh, uh, is, uh, can see, so, so your bloom caster will will uh, produce uh, blooms. You know, they will that can be square, but they usually rectangular. You know? They can be round, yes, and they can also have a shape, yes. In in this case. We don't call them uh, uh, blooms, we call them beam blanks, yes, beam blanks. And they can be used to make, uh, um, uh, these beam blanks can be used to make beams, but also rails. Hmm? Hmm? Okay. Right, and typically, again, around, at around, 20 centimeters, yes, we, anything that's smaller than 20 centimeters, we call billets. Yes? And you have billet casters, they will produce uh, square sections and round sections, which are typically less than um, 200 uh, millimeters in um, uh, dimensions. Yes, Diam dia uh, diameter uh, smaller than 20 two centimeters for uh, round sections. Yeah? Um, and, and again, also, um, if you let uh, blooms be rec uh, rectangular, what's, what's the difference between a, a slab and a bloom? Yes, because they're both rectangular. Well, a slab caster, of course, makes products that will be used for, to make flat product strip, yes, they're width is usually more than um, 60 uh, centimeters, and the the ratio of width to thickness is larger than three. Okay, that's kind of a way to uh, um, make the difference or, or choose your words uh, well. Okay, so this is an example here, right? Um, of uh, blooms, yeah? so, so blooms is what basically comes out of a uh, bloom caster, yes, in um, in, in a steel plant. Mm -hmm. So this one is uh, 13 by 13, yes, and and this one is 250 by 250. So here hereabouts, yes, is would be the the um, the difference between um, billet and blooms, yes. But nobody's going to be upset at you if you if you call them all billets, yes. And and these are uh, beam blanks. And here you see that uh, you you basically pour the steel in a shaped uh, a, sh a shaped caster, yes. Okay. Okay. And and, and this is what you uh, uh, get to see in plants that uh, make this. So slab casters. Uh, produce slabs. Your casters can have uh, many parallel uh, uh, strips. Hmm? For instance, this one here is a, a double strand slab caster, hmm? and uh, so the uh, the width here is 1400. Yes, and of course, the more strands you have, the more capacity you have. Yeah? So a uh, a double strand caster which the casting speeds, by the way, it's kind of interesting to know what typical casting speeds are, uh, about a meter per minute, yes? So it's pretty uh, slow. 
um, what are high casting speeds are five, maybe six, and what's the world record, maybe seven to eight, yes? So for much thinner materials. This is, 20, this is 23 millimeters thick, yes? Yes? So if you, if you have a thinner strip, yes? Yes? And you, you can only go five times uh, faster in casting, your production rates will be much slower. Yeah? So uh, compact, compact um, strip casting, which we will uh, talk about later, uh, have usually much lower production productivities. Hmm? Okay, and, and this is uh, the slabs being cut, the strips, uh, these endless uh, strips being cut. This is an image here where you have three um, strands, so, so one strand, two strands, three strands, and then round, you can see the section here, round um, uh, billets, uh, let me see. Well, it's 2.30, so I guess we should call it round blooms, yes, according to my own definition. Um, so, so you can see here, here the uh, round, and again, you uh, uh, produce them um, in parallel. Uh, casting uh, slightly higher with the uh, uh, billets and... Um, about two meters per minute. And here you see uh, four uh, strands and you see that these uh, billets are uh, square. So that's, that's basically the shape of the, the caster. All right. One of the important things people do after the, um, the slabs or the billets or the blooms are produced is uh, have a look at the surface quality because uh, you have cracks, many types of cracks, longitudinal, transverse, you have segregation can give, you can have center lines that are open. That means that the, inside the material, there is actually a solidification porosity, yes, an open center line. You of course have oscillation marks due to the um, oscillating mold. You can have heat checks from scarfing that may be a little bit mysterious. Sometimes the surface quality of a slab is not very good. And you will burn off, yes, burn off these defects with a burner, yes, by hand or with a machine, yeah. Um, that, uh, you basically melt the material. Yeah? You melt away uh, the material. And that's called scarfing, slab scarfing. Hmm? Uh, so there may be defects related, surface defects related to um, uh, this scarfing, which we call heat checks. Hmm? Scarfing sca uh, curve is, is surface damage hmm? due, due to uh, scarfing. Handling damage, of course, and heat checks from ripping. Um, Certain slabs will actually break in a brittle fashion. Yeah? And uh, it's, it's well known that, for instance, high silicon slabs are very sensitive to, um, to this problem. Some pictures here. Yes? Uh, here you see these oscillation marks. These oscillation marks, you know they're oscillation marks because they're periodic. Yes? Uh, here you see an edge crack. Yes? Here you have a center line crack. Yes? And of course, inclusions are all, can always be a big uh, problem. So that's a big headache, of course, uh, these, these cracks. And uh, in, in practice, you, uh, they get a lot of attention, um, certainly if, if the cracks are major. And they can be major. Sometimes the cracks are not very visible. Hmm? Um, uh, for instance, you can have um, a crack at the surface of a slab, yes? Yes, and that um, oxidation and removal of uh, scale will round the, the sharp edges, yes, and deepen it. But when you start rolling these, uh, these surface defects, they will tend to have uh, to be closed by the rolling process, yes. And so you get things like um, 
rolled in oxides yes that are not really visible anymore yes uh, you have to imagine these are not very huge cracks right? the, 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 the small surface cracks yes and you basically uh, the, the, the cracks and these oxides disappear under the surface and then they will reappear when you for instance do a deep drawing operation you'll get these these really bad surface defects okay and you'll have to figure out you know where they come from and uh, certainly if it's uh, um, affecting a lot of the production hmm? okay and these are other uh, very serious uh, cracks here um, that again will often not appear very clearly in the slab but will give you major problems when you start rolling the material so this is for instance a, um, a, a slab that was uh, fractured during hot rolling during the rough rolling stage okay okay good so um, when we uh, uh, reconvene on, on Tuesday, we'll be talking about the next step. What, what happens to uh, the cast steel that we made, yes? And we'll focus in uh, the coming lecture on uh, hot rolling. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll see how the material, yes? And we'll focus first on slabs, slab materials for strip, production, um, how this material is reheated, yes, goes through a uh, roughing mill, yes, goes through a finishing mill, hmm? run out table to cool it, yes, and then is being coiled, yes. In the process, the material gets thinner, yes? so you go uh, from about say 250 millimeters to an intermediate thickness um, of 20 to 30 millimeters, yes. Um, the, the material at this stage here is called a bar, right? So as a steel student, you should definitely know that there are bars and that there are bars. This bar is where you enjoy a drink, and there's also the transfer bar. This is the transfer bar. This is a, a um, rough rolled uh, slab. And um, the, uh, the, this bar, this transfer bar, is then uh, further reduced to 1.5 to 12 millimeters thickness, typically 5 to 6 millimeters before you call. So in the process, many things happen. The microstructure evolves, the temperature drops, we get phase transformations, etc. So we'll be talking about this on Tuesday. Start to talk about this. On Tuesday, we'll first focus on, uh, re because I don't know what your knowledge is about the, the rolling process. Yes? So we'll first um, introduce a few concept about rolling process that you need to know if you know um, if you want to understand what happens in a hot rolling mill okay so thank you very much and i'll see you tuesday